right, let's get started. Uh, hey, everyone. Welcome once again. Um, by way of introduction, my name is Melissa. Um, I am a first year MBA student at Kellogg School of Management and part of the DECODE team. Would love to give you a little bit more background on what DECODE is about. Um, DECODE is most known for its largest tech and innovation forum jointly hosted with UC Berkeley and Stanford student organizations, alumni networks, and entrepreneurship centers. Um, the organization features speakers at the forefront of technology, innovation, and entrepreneurship from around the world. The mission of Decode is to give students, founders, and investors a platform to share, connect, uh, and be inspired. Over the past five years, uh, our annual Decode Innovation Conference have had over 10,000 audiences every year. Some of our notable speakers include founder and CEO of Zoom, board member of Tesla, Tesla and SpaceX, CEO of Y Combinator, and CEO of Google X. Our most recent conference last October had gathered uh, 1.3 million views across 44 countries. And since then, we've kicked off this speaker series uh, in collaboration with not only Berkeley undergrad, but also top MBA programs at Haas, uh, Northwestern Kellogg, uh, Chicago Booth, and MIT Sloan, with today being our seventh session. We will also be launching a post speaker series event networking session later next year. Um, our next speaker will be in two weeks on April 21st, so stay tuned for more details on those. Um, on to the logistic uh, for tonight's uh, event. So after the fireside chat, there will be a Q&A session and you can send in any questions that you have for our speaker via the Zoom chat. We'll try to go through as many questions as possible. And for those of you who are selected to join our roundtable session with Paul, you should have received um, an email from us confirming your spot. And we will be inviting you to join a separate breakout room directly from the Zoom meeting after the Q&A session ends. So please do stay around um, for that later. Let me check to see if Paul and Shro are still interviewing the backstage uh, before I give his intro. Guess we'll wait for a few moments here. Are we all basically from the Midwest and the West Coast? Where is everyone coming from on the chat while we wait for Paul and Shaw to come out? Nice. Very cool. Lots of San Francisco and San Diego, LA. Wonderful. Yes. Midwest. I'm on. I'm in the Midwest. Oh, KL. 
I'm from Indonesia, very close to Malaysia. Berkeley, Mars, okay. <laughs> Hi, Melissa. Hi. Um, are we waiting for Paul from Pantera? Yeah, we are. So I'm just sort of, I need to, we need to wait for, they're having an interview backstage, which is typical of each of our speaker series. And they've had, they have like one more question to go. So I'm sort of stalling before I give him his intro and, and kick off this, um, the, the discussion tonight. Thanks yeah. for waiting. We, yeah, we have our annual um, investor summit today. He's been hosting for uh, all this afternoon. Um, so I was surprised that he's gonna be, keep doing this tonight. Yeah, he was telling us um, before this that he had, he had a really nice suit on uh, for this LP summit that, that you mentioned. like some more people who join the more the merrier fantastic No, not yet. They're taking a little bit longer, Uranus. Um, but they should be here in just a few moments. So are we all undergrad and graduate school students? Yes, I'm, okay, cool. I'm an MBA student too, Janet. Okay. What, uh, which MBA programs are y'all coming from? Yay, Kellogg, go Cats. Okay, Berkeley, nice. Yeah, go Bears. Paul went to, to Berkeley too, speaker tonight. UCLA got pretty far in that NCAA tournament. All right, let's um, let's get started for real now. 
So yeah, so we're pleased to welcome Paul Veratakit. Uh, by way of introduction, Paul is a partner at Pantera Capital and focuses on the firm's venture capital and hedge fund investments. Pantera is the earliest and largest institutional investor in digital currencies and blockchain technologies, uh, and formerly managed over uh, formerly man uh, managing over four billion dollars in assets. Um, since joining in 2014, Paul has helped to launch the firm's second venture fund uh, and currency funds executing over 100 investments. Uh, Paul also sits on the board of state, uh, Blockfolio and Alchemy. And he's also a mentor at the House Fund, Boost VC and Alchemist, and is an advisor to Orchid, Origin and AI Foundation. Prior to joining Pantera, Paul worked at Strive Capital as an associate focusing on investments in the mobile space, including an early stage investment in App Annie. He graduated from UC Berkeley. Uh, this session will be moderated by Shor Chen, who is a GP at IOVC, a lecturer at uh, UC Berkeley and a faculty member at the Singularity University. Uh, without further ado, let's um, welcome Paul and Shor. Looks like they're here. Awesome. Thanks very much, Melissa. Um, and a special thank you to Paul for making time to join us in the midst of your LP summit. So thank you. No worries. Really thank you for having me. Yeah, and actually really excited to have you here because as you know, Decode has its roots with Berkeley and Stanford students and alumni. And so it's really cool to have a Cal alum with us today. Uh, so maybe without further ado, we can jump right into your story of how you became an investor and uh, focusing on crypto yeah. and blockchain investments. No, I, I love that. And, and just quickly, I mean, I just moderated right before this, I just moderated a fireside chat with one of my portfolio companies that I'm on the board with, and they're two Stanford guys. So again, Berkeley and Stanford, we can coexist. It'll, it's okay. <laughs> I agree. We can coexist. <laughs> awesome. So I, I guess, how, how do you want me to start? Um, I, I'm Maybe we could start with what, everything that's happened to you post-Cal. So how did you yeah. transition from school into the world of venture capital and then even into looking at blockchain? Because obviously, I remember last time we sat down um, for coffee below your house, this was back in 2015, when yeah. we were already looking, obviously, very much at crypto. And this is very early in the game. So maybe tell folks a little bit about how you ended up in crypto so early as well. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's been a long journey overall in my career. I mean, I, I graduated from Cal and I, I wanted to, I wanted to be a lawyer. So I joined a law firm and, you know, worked as a legal assistant for a year and, you know, just kind of saw the work that lawyers did, which is great. But, you know, especially now that I'm on the other side and I use lawyers, but, you know, looking back, and, and looking at what I use my lawyers for, definitely, definitely was the right move not to go into law school. I, you know, as, as I told Shro earlier in, in a separate interview, uh, I am more of a listener and, and less of a visual reader. And so that would not have fit in the legal industry. And so after a year in law school or in, 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 as a legal assistant, I decided to transition over to something more business related. So I joined a uh, a legal, I guess, a um, economic consulting firm, which is a blend of economics, research, analysis, and financial analysis uh, for litigation cases of Fortune 500 companies. And so for me, I thought, you know, that was a great way to transition. I did that for a couple of years, but, you know, same thing as you working in a large firm, financial services, everything was just so slow and, and you're just servicing other folks that are doing way cooler stuff. And so, I really wanted to get out there and, and just do something innovative. And so what I, what I did was, you know, I, this was when people were still, I think, I guess people still look for jobs on Craigslist, but I was just looking around Craigslist and I saw an opening to do business development for a startup company. And this was in 2009. And I thought, great. I mean, I could do this part-time and I would get options. Um, and, and so this was a great way for me to just 
build up my experience in a startup in an environment where everybody's doing startups. And so for me, like I, I mentioned earlier, you know, sometimes you just kind of have to, you know, take some chances and work a little bit extra. And so I was doing this on top of my full-time job. And the more that I was doing business development and helping to think about marketing and strategy and growth, the more that I thought that this was just a lot more fast paced, a lot more exciting. It was a daily deal aggregator site and mobile app. So think of it as like a kayak.com for daily deals, mobile, uh, mobile app and, um, and website. And so, um, you know, as I was learning about how to build a business and I even got to go to TechCrunch Disrupt and meet a lot of people and, and learn about their thoughts on startups, I just had to get into the industry. And so I started applying for different types of jobs. And, you know, I guess compared to other people that get into VC through working at a portfolio company or being an investor, I just applied and found an analyst position and looked at the description and it was just basically doing deep analysis of startup companies. And I thought it'd be great to work on the other side of a startup and understand how investors are evaluating startups. And it was in an industry that I thought was super, you know, super interesting mobile. And I thought it was super early too. And so this was in 2010, you know, I applied, I guess there were hundreds of people that applied. Um, I did, I worked so hard to like figure out like what it took to be a good, you know, mobile investor. I tried out all the different apps. I mean, I was just like dog fooding everything. And I guess I won the position and I got myself into the world of venture capitalists, I venture capital right from, right from the bottom. And, you know, just learned from the partners at the firm. It was a small firm focused just on mobile. So I thought that was great. I mean, there's so many different areas that you could be looking at, but if you could just look at one and especially if it's early enough, you know, become an expert in it and differentiate yourself and then go from there. And that's what I did. I just focused on mobile and became an expert, um, you know, found some great investments, figured out what it took to be a great investment, uh, figure out how to do venture capital. And a lot of it was just learning from them, but a lot of it was just learning from my peers and learning on my own and building up my network that way. But it was one of those things where mobile just got saturated really easy, uh, similar to NFTs. I mean, it's not a very, it's not a very high bar to, to play with mobile and to understand mobile. And so everybody was then getting into the mobile app space. And you know, we thought we had a differentiator by you know, having a bunch of data to source mobile apps. And we were the first ones to be customers of App Annie and sort of created like a money ball for, for mobile app investing. And it got us in some great deals, but you know, that edge quickly faded away and larger firms started to focus on mobile. And so for me, almost like, almost like an entrepreneur, I wanted to pivot or I wanted to figure out where that edge would be. And so my friend at the time and still my friend uh, to today, uh, David Chen of Lightspeed. He was, you know, we're part of uh, Next Gen VC, and uh, you may, you guys may know that it's a sort of pre-partners VC group. And he was telling me about Bitcoin in late 2013, or no, no, it was it was early 2013, and he was talking about, but he was telling me about mining, and I was just like, oh, this is so complicated. And that was one of the questions that I got when I first joined Pantera was was about mining and. You know, it was so hard to explain. I didn't understand it. I, I thought it was crazy that he was minting, you know, value and money from machines. And I just thought he was crazy. But, you know, as we went along in later 2013, uh, Coinbase was starting to get some traction. I actually read more about Bitcoin and it just, it just kind of clicked after I read the white paper. I was just like, wow, this is, this is really interesting. You know, decentralized money and uh, with a capped supply, it really resembles gold and you're able to send this value to anybody trustlessly without any sort of intermediaries. It really did seem like the beginning of the internet, but you know, instead of information, it was money. And you know, I obviously did not think about the rest of what would happen in terms of Ethereum tokens, but even just with Bitcoin, I was like, wow, this is really fascinating. And the first thing I thought about was the uh, developing world, the emerging markets, because 
I also worked at nonprofits at Grameen. And so I was helping under uh, underprivileged women start businesses. So I was like, wow, something like this makes a ton of sense in like Argentina and other places like Africa. And so, you know, I, I thought to myself, hey, this is a great opportunity to join Coinbase. But then I, you know, as I was looking at Coinbase, you know, a recruiter reached out and said, have you looked at Pantera Capital? And I, I saw the background of Dan Moorhead and I thought to myself, well, he's got such an illustrious background coming from the uh, traditional finance hedge fund side of things. And, you know, Tiger Management was one of the, you know, best, best brands out there on the hedge fund side, but he's looking for someone to just focus on private markets. And, you know, there was already another partner that was, you know, on the VC side or just that was partnered up with him, but it was an opportunity to join as a mid-level VC uh, to learn from two completely different guys because the other partner was a former CTO of a company that went public. So a guy that's taken a company public as a CTO, you know, a guy that's been CFO, head of global macro trading at one of the world's most illustrious hedge funds. And I get to bring more of my sort of venture experience to the table. And I get to look at venture in a space that is so early that when I joined the firm, there were only... 10 companies that were really investable at the time. And, you know, I thought to myself, you know, and it's kind of why people are investing into crypto right now. The, the, the reward is so high and there is risk, but the reward is just so high that if I just give it, you know, a couple of years just to see if it goes anywhere, it's totally worth it. If it doesn't go anywhere, then I'm back to the grind and, you know, it's one of those things where I've switched industries already. So, you know, I've gone through it already. So, you know, I had that experience, but if it really hits something, then I'm going to do very well. So that, that's the transition over to crypto. I, I figured this is the right, the right place, the right time. And I got to continue to invest, which I really do like doing. I think what's really unique about your experience is that you've really seen venture from like the entire journey perspective from starting at a very early intro stage all the way to obviously now being a partner and in leading investments and sitting on boards. And I think that's a perspective that oftentimes people don't get to see this whole thing because either they leave halfway in the middle or they come halfway in the middle. So I yeah. think it's really unique that you have that perspective. And you've also seen the entire blockchain crypto space really from its very nascent days. So maybe transitioning a little bit from your VC days into talking a little bit about your journey in blockchain and crypto as well. Obviously, things looked very different when uh, we were just talking about blockchain stuff like way back in 2015 all the way to now, especially given how quickly the markets are. So maybe you could walk all of us through a little bit about the surprising or maybe not surprising changes you've seen over the years. Yeah, it's been it's been such a roller coaster. I mean, when I joined in 2015, it, it was it was a cool experience in that like the first thing that I did was I went to a crypto conference and I, I kid you not, there were like the geekiest guys there, like computer scientists. There were just, you know, random speculators, guys in cowboy hats, to some guys in business suits that look really scammy. And then you have maybe a few guys that were, you know, serial entrepreneurs or guys that, you know, had, had done some stuff in the startup space, but that was just a really, really small fraction of things. And so, you know, the diversity in the space and um, the, the imbalance in the space was just, was just crazy. And so those were the crypto conferences. There was just a lot of like uh, noise out there and they weren't that there wasn't that much that much attention on them too. So there's maybe one crypto conference like a month or something, or maybe even like a decent sized conference like once a quarter for the first like few quarters. Um, you know, the, the press was very poor, it's very negative. It was it was really lonely. <laughs> I have to say it's really lonely. And 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 you know it's it's nice to be able to talk about what you do to other people. And, you know, it's always obviously nice that they understood it, but, you know, even the first part is just respecting it, right? And so I remember like coming into this space and some of my friends are like, 
Bitcoin is such a scam. Like that's such a that's such a harsh word. I was like, oh man, so now I'm in like a scammy industry, and you know, it's like, what are you doing, right? You know what I mean? It's like, I don't know. I mean, I think there's a lot of promise here. It's like, and I, and it's one of the myths that we talked about during our uh, during our sessions today. Bitcoin is just used for drug dealing and Silk Road and all of that. So I think there was just a lot of negativity for the first year or so, and. In terms of companies, I mean, a lot of them were just one person computer scientists that really didn't think about how a technology would, would get to market and what is sort of needed for a technology to sort of develop. So we're seeing a lot of <clears throat> a, a lot of solo founders, a lot of imbalanced teams, things that just weren't really investable. But you know, one of the first theses that we had in the space, me and Dan, we sat down and he's like, hey you know, you just got here, the first thing that we have to do is into every single company like Coinbase all around the world, um, you know, because we were already in a company called Bitstamp that was competitive to Coinbase. So, uh, you know, except Bitstamp wasn't focused on, uh, you know, brokerage, it was just focused on the exchange, but it was already competitive. But basically, he wanted me to go out there and find local on ramps in all the geographies that matter for cryptocurrency. So, you know, the first investment that I did was in the Coinbase of Korea. And, you know, with Korea, huge gaming population, they're all huge gamblers, which is great for cryptocurrency. They have capital controls, which is, you know, helpful for crypto because, you know, people do use crypto to move money across borders. And, you know, they had a huge mobile population. And so that's an example of being in early, following the thesis, and you know it ended up selling for you know twelve x in a very short period of time. And so we kind of went out there and executed that thesis, even all the way up until today, we still execute that thesis. So you know with with what's gone on in our space, it's really nice to have theses from uh, time to time that you just are so bullish on. You go out there, you find the companies were in the top brokerage in Latin America, and they are just about to raise a monster round led by one of the, you know, best well known growth companies out there. And so that thesis still plays out. But as we move from 2014, where there weren't too many companies 2015, we started seeing, you know, I'd say enterprise companies start talking about cryptocurrency, we had the R3 project, which was a consortium of some of the largest banks, JP Morgan, etc you know, getting into cryptocurrency or getting into blockchain. Remember, then it was like trying to remove the word Bitcoin, remove the word cryptocurrency. Everything was all about the underlying technology, but it was all about like, you know, more centralized idea around these consortiums of using the blockchain almost as a, a database, as a service. And, you know, that was kind of the, uh, you know, heading toward kind of like a more like bear market for the industry because a lot of enterprises were wanting to use blockchain. 2015, we actually saw uh, a lot of serial entrepreneurs coming into space, but a lot of the applications that they were going for, consumer applications, because it was just Bitcoin and people were just not educated enough about Bitcoin, none of those consumer applications like really worked and none of the developer tooling really works. So then we headed into 2016, where it was all enterprise. And that's kind of when I was, you know, you know, when we when we talked in 2015, I was already starting to kind of wonder where the space is going. 2016, I actually almost left the space. I was thinking, okay, this isn't going anywhere. Every VC that I was talking to was saying, okay, if you, if you have a blockchain company, I don't want to see it. You know, it was, it was pretty depressing. And so I actually started to wonder whether this was going to be the right industry for me. And as I was just like halfway, like starting to look around, I met an entrepreneur or I guess now a fund manager. His name is Olaf Carlson Wee of Polychain. And I had conversations with him and he was telling me about Ethereum, which I was already like starting to get intrigued by, you know, we, we looked at Ethereum, we didn't do too much with Ethereum. That was probably the biggest miss of Pantera was not investing into Ethereum in the crowd sale early enough. But he was telling me about this multi-token world and 
about all the different use cases, especially around DeFi that early on. And, you know, we bet on, we bet on Olaf, we invest into a GP around a polychain. And from there in late 2016, early 2017, Ethereum started to enable community owned projects uh, and decentralized applications. And from then, I mean, it's just been quite the journey because we kind of went through and we can always get into more detail, but we went through kind of the bubble of 2017, it burst. And, you know, I think part of the reason why it burst was because there's just so much money made and so much, so much scams out there. And a lot of retail investors really just got burned. But the best thing about these bull markets that happen is it does educate a lot of people, whether you do get burned or not, and you get awesome talent that comes in and you get the problems uh, that, that emerge that need to get solved. And from 2017, we really, we really saw that scalability needed to get solved. And obviously regulations needs to get solved and, and that sort of thing. And so uh, 2018 and 2019, it was all about building. We know the problems that need to be solved. Let's build. <clears throat> the great thing is it's a bear market. So we don't have employees leaving and starting their own funds or you know, living in Costa Rica because they've made so much money. Now everybody's just focused on building their business. And then you know, late 2019, early 2020, we're starting to see progress with scalability. And you know, DeFi starts taking off. DeFi starts taking off for I think two reasons. A global pandemic where you know, people are, 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 you know, moving money to things that might have, have value and might have asymmetric opportunities. And that's Bitcoin. I think something else that also helped was basically um, decentralized exchanges starting to emerge and have the right user experience to actually get people onboarded and trading. And I think the biggest, the biggest block to innovation, I think, in 18 and 19 was the fact that people did get scared from regulation and therefore none of the projects that were launching could ever actually decentralize. No one could actually issue a token that can get into the hands of users. And if that doesn't happen, the space is not going anywhere. So by being able to have decentralized exchanges that allow you to have tokens in the hands of users, and of course that spawned a bunch of liquidity mining, that's what really just started, you know, DeFi and these projects being able to actually launch, get out there, get traction. And that's kind of where we are today. Thank you so much for sharing, especially all the ups and downs of this industry. I'm curious, now that you've seen really all the bubbles and bursts and everything else in between, does history help inform the future? And what are some of the lessons that you wish you had known back a few years ago? Yeah, I mean, lessons learned from, let's just say, <clears throat> the, the, the biggest crash uh, so far has been the 2017 or 2018 crash. 2017 was a great year. And then, you know, early 2018, everything just kind of fell down. You know, I think for, for us, I mean, it's just so hard to, it's just so hard to have, you know, the right discipline sometimes when the markets are moving so quickly. And it was moving so quickly in 2017 that if you didn't make a decision on whether to invest, and we're a large fund, right? So every investment is usually at least a million dollars, if not all the way up to $10 million. You have to make a decision right then and there in the meeting because the round is already oversubscribed. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's like that. And, uh, and so being a bit more disciplined, and it helps now because there is... <clears throat> you know, the rounds aren't moving as quickly because of just having to, to deal with, you know, legal structuring and launch and, and liquidity mining and all of that. But in general, I mean, it's, it's not having to be forced to make decisions and not making decisions with a gun to your head and doing proper diligence. Um, not that we weren't doing proper diligence, but it's just one of those things where sometimes you just have to like cut some corners just to make sure that you can get into deals that, you know, you think are, are good. And, you know, sometimes when you have a fund that is a certain size, you just, you have, you're kind of forced to deploy capital. And that's also, also a lesson for entrepreneurs not to take too much capital because you are going to be, you know, 
pressure to deploy that capital. And so that's one of the lessons learned is, you know, continue to stick to your process, you know, even though you do speed things up, but there's sometimes like, you know, you just have to like not, you know, cut corners sometimes. And then I think the other lesson learned from that, that market is just being as data driven as possible. I think you can do that with every decision that you have in life, but, you know, especially in the crypto markets where, you know, startup companies taking, taking themselves public so early, I mean, that's such a crazy phenomenon. And, you know, when you have that much liquidity, you have to be really, really data driven. You really, really have to have strong connections with those entrepreneurs and knowing every step of the way, whether this is going to make it or not, and be very quick about de-risking uh, because, you know, the space moves so quickly. If you figure out something, there's a pretty good chance that someone else on that cap, cap table or someone else that's a whale or is also going to figure that out. And the price is going to be able to move really quickly and, and all that kind of stuff. And so you have to have an edge when it's so volatile because the companies are so early. And so for us, I mean, it's, you know, doubling down, expanding our team on the trading and infrastructure and data side of things. I think you've definitely explained the importance of that data piece, even from very early in your career all the way until now to really have reliable data to look at, especially within the crypto blockchain world now, uh, even though it's been a few years in development, we still don't have all the equivalent infrastructure as we do in the mobile or internet world of things yet. So where would someone potentially go if they wanted to look for more accurate sources of data or they wanted to ensure data integrity. Any recommendations there? Yeah, there's quite a few firms that are focused on helping to understand on-chain data. So the beauty of the blockchain is it is a decentralized database that everybody has access to view. And, you know, it's, it's you know, it's making sense of that data and being able to query that data. And so there are tools like Dune Analytics where you can actually uh, go out there and build different types of graphs and, and models off of on-chain data for specific types of protocols. And so being able to understand users, active users, all of that, I mean, you know, just looking at the on-chain data is, is really sort of sort of interesting. And then of course there are other developer platforms out there that developers use for tooling that can also be collecting quite a bit of data. And, you know, some of it may be on-chain, some of it may not be on-chain. So we're investors in Series A um, leads of Alchemy, which is the, you know, the fireside chat that I'll send you later on. But those guys are two Stanford guys, and they've been basically powering most of the NFT applications most of the decentralized finance applications where think of it as they are setting up specific servers to run on these blockchains and be able to have tools where you can query, you can manage your crashes, your logs, you know, all that kind of stuff that you see on the mobile side of things, but specifically for blockchain. Now, they do it for Ethereum right now, but they're going to be moving over to other blockchains. And so it will enable developers to basically just hook up to their API and then, you know, access all of the different tools. And, you know, I think that's going to really just enable more and more innovation and potentially even more and more collection of data so that people can use it for different things. I think this is super helpful. The reason why I asked this question is also, I think for a lot of folks who are here, whether they're currently a student uh, or they're decade plus into their career, I think it's a lot more helpful for folks to have an additional channel for actually doing something hands-on, playing with data or doing something other than just buying and owning cryptocurrencies. That's at least a way for them to better interact with the technology and better understand the capacity of what it has the potential to build. So would love to follow up with you in addition to the fireside chat on any kind of yeah. websites or resources that you would recommend us to share with students and alumni so they have something that they can click through and play around with i i think i think the i i think the steps to get started in crypto for me are you know i think 
Bitcoin, usually people just ask about Bitcoin and, you know, they, they want to place to store their wealth where there is significant upside. And so we recommend anywhere from one to 10%, but I'd say for, for, for folks, I mean, you know, even just like you're a lower single digit percentage of your net worth in Bitcoin is just a, a great way to get started because an amount where if it just evaporates, you won't be in a dire situation. But, you know, enough where if something happens, then, you know, you could be in a very great situation. So that's why a single digit net percentage uh, of your net worth, you know, makes a lot of sense in Bitcoin. And then beyond that, then you could then buy, you know, something like Ethereum. And, uh, you know, once you have Bitcoin and Ethereum, then, you know, I think the next thing that people do that, that I've been recommending and that, you know, I've, I've seen work is, well, you know, especially during an environment right now where you just can't get yield anywhere. You know, I remember during the pandemic, I mean, I had a lot of my net worth in just USD and my bank accounts would say, hey, our interest rates are dropping to 25 basis points, 0.25%. And now we have stable coins that are backed by US dollar one to one where you could be generating up to 8.6 or even 10 to 12% by basically lending out your, uh, your stable coin. And so you can get yield with Bitcoin, you get yield with Ethereum, and there are other consumer applications out there that are basically taking away the complexity of needing to, you know, do other things that you can be doing to get yield on cryptocurrency by just providing sort of a, you know, uh, a yield consumer app. So I think those are some of the easiest ways to get in. Once you go beyond that, then I would say, you know, what you could do is you can, you know, just test out some of those DeFi protocols and you just have to set up a MetaMask account and then, you know, uh, try out something around, uh, I'd say something around lending and borrowing is probably the next uh, big hurdle for people to do set up the MetaMask account and go to something like Compound or Aave and actually lend out um, your Bitcoin or Ethereum, but in a non custodial way. So, to recap, first step is Bitcoin, then look into Ethereum and other cryptocurrencies, then you go into yield farming, then into remaining of deco, uh, DeFi projects and protocols, basically. Yeah, buy Bitcoin, buy Ethereum, lend those out, and then you could then buy something like DPI, which is an index of DeFi tokens. Um, and then of course you could buy some specific DeFi tokens if you want. We're really, big, we're really bullish on decentralized exchanges. Uh, so decentralized exchanges we think are super promising. Um, you know, you have a company like Uniswap that does on a daily basis, sometimes more volume than Coinbase, but the team of 15 people and they can all do that because you don't need the infrastructure to maintain something like Coinbase because it's all running on smart contracts. So something like that has a ton of potential. And then, of course, trying out some of those platforms by going on Uniswap or going on Compound. And then if you really want, you can get into some really interesting food coins <laughs> or something like that. This is great. I, I was actually just about to follow up with a question of, Bitcoin, Ethereum versus indices, because obviously people tend to argue that there's a huge correlation between Bitcoin and Ethereum and a number of the other cryptocurrencies. So to what extent do we think about only the major large cap versus the rest of cryptocurrencies? It's a great question. I mean, the way that we structured our liquid fund is we do have, for us, about 30 to 40 percent Bitcoin and Ethereum. And then the rest are mid cap and then maybe even some smaller caps that are like, let's just say, we look at the top 100 things that have enough liquidity that we can move around. But as an individual investor, you don't need to. But at the end of the day, I mean, let's just, let's just talk about some of the price targets for Bitcoin and Ethereum this year. Some say Bitcoin may hit 100 to $150,000. That's a two or three X. Obviously, that's great in the traditional world, right? I mean, two or three X, like you'll, you'll take that all the time. For, for crypto investors, two or three X, you are a failure if you get two or three X. And so, <laughs> that's, that's like great <laughs> solid hedge. Uh, and, and Ethereum could be getting to, you know, um, 
I think some could say it could get to maybe on 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 highest like uh, five to six thousand. That would have been a five to six x from where it started earlier this year around a, you know a thousand or something. That's great too. But if you look at some of these other DeFi protocols that we've invested into in the last like two or three months on the liquid side of things, we're seeing things that are getting double digit sort of multiples within a small time time period. Uh, all the way up to, we have one that's like 100x in a few months. And so it's one of those things where there's just a lot more upside on cryptocurrencies that are non-Bitcoin, Ethereum. And so it's nice to have a balance across so that you can hit some of those home runs. It's just like venture capital. You're going to have some home runs, though. And the bull market seems to be like a very high percentage of home runs. Uh, but at the end of the day, Bitcoin, and Ethereum are still, you know, year over year consistent returns. That makes sense. Uh, I was about to ask as well, um, given that you invested into Olaf's Polychain really early on, is hedge fund the way to go? You know, I, I think I think it depends on who your investor base is or who you want to be fundraising from. I think um, I think right now in our industry, it's still it's still early for institutional capital and because there are different types of assets with different types of liquidity profiles, we're seeing institutional capital be a bit more, you know, a, a bit more familiar with the venture style and not having to sort of make decisions between equity versus tokens. Um, I, I think for a lot of institutional capital allocators, you know, when a space is complex, having too many decision points is just not good. So whether it's just investing into equity and venture capital or investing into a venture type structure where you can get all of these assets all together and, and basically just saying, hey, I'm investing into Pantera. You guys just, you know, instead of this, you know, I can get tokens, I can get equity. Why don't you guys just, I could get Bitcoin, which is, is even different than tokens. People just think of Bitcoin as its own thing. Why don't you guys just kind of figure out the mix for me? And so that's kind of what a lot of institutional capital allocators are thinking of. I think as a fund manager, though, it's always nice to have more permanent capital. And so if you can raise it where, you know, you do have a little bit of leeway to, you know, to, to, to manage through different cycles. Because again, if your investor base leaves when the market's bare, that's not great because that's when the best investments are done. Right now, all of my best returns are, you know, and I hadn't seen this because uh, we hadn't seen a bear market like 2018 and 2019 after such a bull market. But the returns from this 2018, 2019 companies are going to be amazing because the valuations are so low. Very true. Um, I, I think we've talked through most of the things about the markets, but the last question is this volatility piece, which obviously is one of the biggest differentiating factors compared to other asset classes where you have cryptocurrencies being one of the most diverse, which is a good thing in that it's the least correlated with other asset classes. But at the same time, you also having, you, you're also seeing this asset class with the highest volatility. So any thoughts around that? Um, that's probably why I asked the hedge fund point if, Given the volatility, it makes sense to have something that looks like that. But curious to hear your thoughts around volatility. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So I do think as these markets get more liquid over time, and especially Bitcoin and Ethereum, the volatility won't be as crazy. But at the end of the day, you know, for use cases where you don't want volatility, you know, as it, if you're if you're speculating or you're diverse, you're diversifying your portfolio, volatility isn't necessarily a bad thing, especially if you know the asset's going up, you know, year over year or you know every two years. And you, and if you're, I would I would advise, you know, for for those that are uh, investing into this space to you know to try to think about things from a longer term, unless you're going to spend time to really know the markets and be going in and out. But you know, I think for use cases that don't want volatility, and this could be around store value, this could be around payments, then 
you should be using stable coins uh, for collateral or for payments. And that's what we're seeing right now. I mean, USDC and other stable coins, the market cap of st the stable coin market is about like 50 or $60 billion. And we're seeing large legacy companies like Visa using stable coins as part of their rails to move money across border because it's faster, cheaper, and more transparent. And so, you know, if you don't want the volatility, you don't need the volatility, but you can get the benefits of the blockchain. Or, you know, if you are kind of coming to this space, you're going to have to be fine with it, but you should just basically think of it from a longer term point of view and just kind of, you know, put money in there. Don't watch it as much or just, you know, watch it, but like, don't pull money out and just kind of see what happens in a few years. This is great. Um, so I have one last question for you. I also have some folks DMing me questions. So if you guys have other questions, feel free to ping me as well. Um, but let me ask you my last question first, which is, uh, we really spent a lot of time looking at the past and the present. But if we were to talk about future projections for a little bit, um, I know you do a lot of writing and every year you do this yearly projection about what you think will happen. And what is really cool is that you go back the year afterwards uh, to review and say how many of your projections turn out to be true. Um, so I won't ask you to kind of repeat things that folks can go read um, on your blog. But I, I would be curious to ask you that question from a personal or even professional development standpoint, given that we have a lot of students as well as alumni, um, so both younger and more experienced folks in the group. Any areas within blockchain and cryptocurrencies that you find to be super exciting and specific advice that you would recommend from a professional development standpoint as to what folks can do? Yeah, I, I just saw the chat and you know I do think that DeFi, decentralized finance, and that spans a, a few different categories. You know, I'd say being able to send money to someone else uh, without having to go through banks. I mean, using a, a cryptocurrency that is sort of part of decentralized finance. But for what we're seeing, we're seeing actual companies being built in a distributed, decentralized way and you know transactions sort of happening within those community owned projects that you know we feel like are also part of decentralized finance and then also use cases around speculation infrastructure for that um, that is built on smart contracts where there isn't someone sort of extracting fees and you can actually be benefiting or getting actually part of the fees all being part of decentralized finance so that would be you know, decentralized exchanges, decentralized liquidity pools, decentralized borrowing and lending could be variable rate, fixed rate. Uh, and, you know, we're starting to see decentralized insurance. So a lot of the different industries that you're seeing out there are, are being decentralized. I mean, we're seeing hiring marketplaces, decentralized eBay's, all of that. And so I, I would say just, um, you know, you can, you, you can follow me on, on Twitter or, my blog Verata verdict, but you know, just do as much reading as you can on the use cases and go out there and just try out some of those use cases. You know, one of my big aha moments for DeFi was during 2017 when I had to help facilitate an ICO transaction. And I was for some reason I was the middleman for this one for Pantera and this this crypto project. And so my company sent me a million dollars of Ethereum and I had to send it over to the project. And I was like, wow, like I've sent, I sent Ethereum transactions before, but like to send this much, it's a little scary and hopefully we'll fix that problem where, you know, if I miss a certain letter, the, the transaction just doesn't uh, get stalled or evaporate, but I did do it correctly, think, thankfully. And I sent, and this was before, the network got clogged, but I was able to send a million dollars to China uh, for 33 cents. And when I saw that transaction hit and it was verified on the blockchain, I was like, oh my gosh, this is like the best thing ever. And so just doing one of those types of transactions where you're doing it on your own, you're, you're managing your keys, like you'll kind of see why this is so destructive. 
I love it. I think that's a very, <laughs> I see Kevin's comment. That sounds very stressful, uh, but also a very cool moment when things went through, I'm sure. So maybe I'll summarize one category of questions that I've gotten through DMs, um, and then we'll shift on over to the roundtable application. Um, for anyone here that doesn't know about the roundtable, um, this is obviously uh, something that you can reach out to either Melissa, our lovely MC, or anyone else on the DCO team about. Um, there's a written application to attend the roundtable so you can turn on mic and um, video and ask um, Paul questions directly. So I'll, I'll summarize this one category, which is really more around career advice. So if they're currently doing something in traditional finance or traditional corporate work or even on startups, what is something that they can do part time that gives them a little bit of exposure professionally, not in terms yeah. of personal investing, but professionally, what is something that they could do to kind of bring parts of cryptocurrency or blockchain? Yeah, so we're starting to see engineers and MBAs, but people that are like highly qualified, like thinking about coming into space and starting to come into this space, you know, it was a grind the last, you know, seven years to convince folks to leave their high paying jobs. And it's already a grind for startups to get those quality of, 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 uh, of folks to come on, but then convincing them to join a crypto company that they just don't understand. They're not quite sure like when that inflection point is, is going to happen and if they're going to be able to make a lot of money. And so, you know, now people are really starting to see the opportunity, not only because they could be learning more about crypto and speculating on the side, but these companies are starting to really make money and really create applications that they can really understand. But that is the biggest challenge right now in the industry is, is talent. And so, you know, I think if you have any sort of interest whatsoever, I actually think that this is the best time because there's so much money in crypto right now and they're looking to pay to get people in the door because there's just so much opportunity right now to actually be building transformative companies that you should, you know, even, even before you might be willing to sort of take the leap, just just learn about different use cases, find companies you find interesting, and maybe even just do like a, a, a part-time internship or something. I mean, uh, obviously, if you're, if you're willing to jump in and, and, and you're ready to start, then that's great. But I think try out the product, see, you know, if you, and, and if you need convincing, just do some sort of like contract work or part-time internship because they can use all of the help that they can, they can gather right now because it's, this, they're, they're all being funded and there's just not enough talent coming in yet. This is great. Um, I asked this iteration of the question because I've gotten a lot of different versions of questions where people are excited about the space, but exactly like you said, they're not sure what the inflection point is. So if they're currently in a corporate job or in a startup job, they're not sure what the right timing is. So I think people are looking for something that they could do to kind of help them dip their toes in the water, so to speak, um, to help them figure out this transition phase. Yeah, they can go to our website. We have a lot of educational content and we're going to have a lot more coming out of the summit because we gathered, you know, as of today, all of the best entrepreneurs in the space and they're just talking about all the different use cases out there. And so I think the key is really to figure out which use cases, if any, are really interesting to you from sort of a passion point of view or from a sort of compelling, you know, making money part of view. And so, you know, you can start off with our website, but, you know, it, it, if you don't find those use cases, then, you know, that's, that's the challenge. Um, when I joined the space, there was no content whatsoever. Now there's a lot more content. And so you just kind of have to get in front of it. This is great. Um, also, I think there's, I'm getting some questions, like very specific questions around market pricing, et cetera. Um, but I think really the intention is that expectations are really, really high in the crypto world. Um, but at least there is a lot of potential for growth. So if you're, uh, whether you're early in your career or looking to switch later on in your career, at least when you're evaluating different fields, it definitely sounds like this is a space where you have a lot yeah. of potential. Yeah, I think in terms of pricing, I mean, you know, I don't, I don't want to get into too much detail, but I think the, I think Bitcoin has a lot more 
legs because institutions and on ramps are still early. Guys like PayPal have been great, but there's more of those types of companies and robo advisors that will just enable more access to Bitcoin and institutions are starting to warm up. And on the Ethereum side of things, you know, we're, we're starting to just see a lot of really cool applications being built. And on top of that, you know, it could be sort of stablecoin related payments or not. But, you know, I think on top of that, scalability is really hindering the Ethereum side of things and for decentralized applications. So we have a lot of capital going into that part and a lot of companies that on, in combination with other Ethereum type companies that are out there helping to deal with scalability. I really do think in the next year or two, we're just going to see a lot of really cool new types of companies being being offered for the public. I am getting some very specific questions like the effect of cross exchange um, DX projects like Thor, et cetera. Um, but maybe in the interest yeah. of time, we'll kind of get into that in the roundtable session. Um, but I did get uh, questions around, for example, if Bitcoin hits a certain price like 500K or a million or even higher, if it would make people turn away for something that has more growth potential, more lucrative, or uh, if it would destroy the crypto world altogether. So all of these questions I've taken note of and we'll kind of take these very specific questions into the round table. But I'm also getting um, some messages, I won't say from who, but there are folks uh, who are pinging me saying, I'm gonna quit and start a crypto company. <laughs> so glad that there are folks getting inspired. Um, so thank you so much for your time with us today, Paul, to make sure that um, we have enough time for the round table session. We'll wrap up here on main stage. Thank you so much to everyone in the main audience that has joined us today. Um, we will take the rest of the discussion over to the round table. Thank you again, Paul. Thank you. Thank you.